Hello Internet, my name is Chamomile. And so we are catching, we glazed over this a little bit because we were talking about other stuff, we were talking about the Bruja, but uh, we are actually doing one more Ghoul quest, even though Ghouls, as you mentioned earlier, they're mostly in Santa Monica. Right. Yeah, I mean, you would kind of expect to see ghouls uh, sort of all over the place. Just, uh... No, come on. It totally but yeah, I, I, just, just because I ghouls... Can't. Every vampire you'd expect to have ghouls, Everyone but they do tend to thin out quite a bit after Santa Monica. I just wanted to ask you if you came from Santa Monica. His name yeah. is hey, Cam, Cam. Are you doing the podcast? Whoa. Uh, yeah, and and well. you were, like, and you, is this a mannequin of me? What? Where is it wearing my clothes? I guess it is a mannequin. Yeah, you know, fun story. Fun, fun, fun story. Uh, funny story. You're, you're, you're gonna laugh. I actually, I mistook the mannequin for you. Uh, but yeah, no. Nah, I mean, he just happens to be wearing the same outfit as you, I guess. Where are we? Uh, we're in Pizza Surf, home of the Surf Pizza. Eat it for sustenance. Our new sponsors. I don't remember coming here. I just remember being at the... And where do I even... Where is this pizza... I've got a pizza in my hand. I don't know where it came from. And you're with a mannequin. Like, it has a wig that looks like my hair. And it kind of... That kind of looks like my face. I, I guess you just have one of those faces. There's nobody here, Cam. Like, I was just at the counter, and I got a pizza. But there was nobody in the kitchen or anything. All these tables are empty. I'm... We should probably leave. Well, I mean, it's the pandemic. Of course, they're not doing a whole lot of business, so they've got a skeleton crew. There must have been someone in the kitchen. All right. Like, maybe they were, you know, like, cleaning something and you didn't see them, but obviously someone made you the pizza, which... Okay, well, let's, let's take the pizza and leave. Oh, like, totally this isn't a real restaurant, Cam. Like, there's like mannequins everywhere. I think they're moving. Like, yeah. can we go? I, they have to make the place look, you know, active. Uh, for a second there, I was worried the game was glitching out, but no, it's fine. Everything is fine. But yeah, no, they, just, they didn't have to make the place look active, you know, in the pandemic. I'm sure lots of restaurants are doing the mannequin thing. Like... <sighs> like, there's... I, I just... Can, can we just do the podcast somewhere else? Let's go back to Mother Sorrow's house. Just made a gingerbread. I mean, okay, but we're gonna have to kill her first. I'm telling you, I can take her. If you just, if you just let me finish fighting with her, like I'm sure, and then we would have had a nice gingerbread house to stay in. I guess I still don't trust that gingerbread, but I think she used a little too much baby's blood when she was making it, but otherwise it was fine. Is that is that a normal ingredient? In don't worry about it. Uh, like, I'm not even sure how we're going to leave this place. Like, I'm pretty sure there, all these doors are, yeah, they're all barred. I'm not even sure this is a real door. It's, like, ornamental. Well, I mean, you know, we have to have gotten in here somehow. I guess we'll just get out the same way. Wait, hold on. Oh, I just got... Money in my pay. They are actually sponsoring us. I just sent somebody in my PayPal account. Huh. Yeah. See, this is this is all good things happening. It says it was converted from human dollars to your currency. That that's fine, right? What what is your currency if not human dollars? I don't know. I'm concerned. Well, I mean, I'm sure whatever amount, you know, we're still a pretty small podcast right now. I'm sure whatever amount of human dollars that comes out to, it's, it's all, it's a start, right? This is definitely a good thing. Like, come on, first, like, we had more than one viewer on one of our videos. More than one person is watching this show, Requiem. And, and we have a sponsor who is giving us an amount of human dollars. 
why do they feel the need to specify a human dollars? Well, you know, there's a lot of bots on PayPal, right? They have a real bot problem. They probably just, they're verifying for us that they're humans and not bots. You know what? Fine. You know what? Let's do it. Pizza surf. Consume it for sustenance. That's right. We need sustenance because we brought enough money for like a two-day road trip. And we've been in here for, I think, three weeks now? Yeah, I think the spiders have been using my debit card. Did you give one of the spiders your debit card? They took our luggage! Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going the wrong way. Why are we back in Santa Monica? We just need to make a quick visit to the beach to catch a boat so that we can... And, and, here is why we absolutely cannot uh, pack up our equipment and try to go record somewhere else. I, I promise you, you want to do this episode today. You don't want to wait on this one, because we're going to go and investigate a sarcophagus. <gasps> and you know what's inside, inside a sarcophagus? Every sarcophagus has a mummy inside, man. Is he romanceable? Uh, not in the original game, but I do think they patched that back in. Oh, thank goodness. Finally. I was about to say, finally, a sexy mummies, but mummies are just automatically sexy. That goes without saying. You're gonna, you're gonna love the supercut version of this in Kingdom Hearts. You just <laughs> don't worry about why. I'm filled with concern. I assume the mummy ties back into the antediluvian thing. Yes. We are. Which I feel like we've already kind of touched upon, but I think, like, part of what happens with uh, World of Darkness is that you've got too many people writing too much fluff and everything gets over detailed, which is also what has happened to Galarian. Like, you don't need. You get to a point where the fluff is just subtracting from your setting, honestly. Like, I'm yeah, not an anti fluff person at all, but, like,. When you've got so many people contributing so much, it's like, there's diminishing returns gets hit eventually. Yeah, uh... Old World of Darkness had, and uh, if you're a... D&D &D veteran, then you will probably have noticed this most of all in... Pathfinder, which was also following the same model of 3.0 and 3.5 edition D&D. &D. They had a model of releasing a new source book about once a month. Uh, which is a good idea in theory, you know, a constant steady stream of content. In practice, that means you have a whole lot of source books that are outsourced to your C team. Like, there's got to be a happy meeting be medium between, like, 5th edition, where it's, like, once every, like, year. And Pathfinder, which is, like, two every month. Right? Yeah, I mean, 5th edition really doesn't release... They don't, they don't do a whole lot of fluff either. Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide was sort of like that. Where the fuck is Mercurio? Am I supposed to do something else first? Ah, uh, I've got to go talk to Lord Cole like, first. I've never really played 5th edition, but just the impression I've gotten is, like, they've been around for a long, a while by now, and they have, the amount of stuff, new stuff they've added to the game is so minimal. Like, they've added one new class, they do add a lot of subclasses, like Xanathar's Guide to Everything had a decent chunk of content in it. Um, Wayfarer's Guide to Eberron and Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica were very setting-specific, right? Like, if you wanted to run uh, Forgotten Realms content or Greyhawk content or whatever with any degree of faithfulness to the source material, you really couldn't use anything from either of those two books, because every single option in there was so very, very specific to their specific settings. Um, now, you know, in the games that I run, if someone wants to say that they, uh, they're they playing one of those blue-skinned wizard guys who just fell through a portal from Ravnica, I shrug my shoulders and roll with it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the specific style of that specific group. You know, there's definitely something to be said for 
trying to have a uh, a setting that is less madcap and off the wall and more cogent and focused. Um, which I you know I say like in the game that I run and like to be clear, it's not because I mandate the game should be like that. Even it's just because I roll with whatever the group does, and that's what the group is doing. So. But, uh, yeah, so Xanathar's Guide to Everything is probably the one source book they've released so far, and Volo's Guide to Monsters, actually, where, where it's like, uh, this is a significant expansion of players option, player options for any setting with, you know, standard D&D assumptions in it. Uh, and that's, they do have another one coming out, so across six years since 2014 when 5th edition dropped, uh, they have had a total of two, nearly three source books with like a lot of really usable player options. That's really minimal. Yeah. Like I think you could do more than that. And they are they are uh, releasing adventure paths, which have very little player content, but is content at all. So they have been releasing about one of those every nine months or so. And then we asked for fourth edition it was D and D was in a very precarious spot. In some way. Yeah, uh, fourth edition was not kind to the D and D audience. Pathfinder absolutely devoured them for a long while. Uh, fourth edition fans like to make excuses. They are dumb. They always have been and always will be. The brass tax <laughs> is. It's like yeah, you 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 can make excuses forever because. You know, you can say, oh, well, if this one thing had been different, then everyone would have loved 4th Edition. Like, you know, if it had a different marketing campaign or if it had released at a different time and blah, 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 blah. And, like, ultimately what that comes down to is, like, yeah, if I work from the circumstances 4th Edition was released under compared to Pathfinder and then work backwards to figure out what's unfalsifiable, then you can come up with something where you can't prove that 4th Edition wouldn't have done better under those circumstances while being the same game but like the actual available evidence is that 4th edition did very poorly and Pathfinder did quite well yeah I've never actually encountered somebody who was write or die for 4th edition outside of the internet yeah and neither have I outside of the internet but uh <laughs> You will get, uh, it comes up in indie game dev circles relatively frequently, like as in more often than never, which is how often it comes up with anyone else. <laughs> Cream. Like, I, do, I, I like that gag there. Where, like, because it's the world of darkness and it is full of just, you know, filthy, disgusting, amoral people, like, it would not be weird for him to be using camera three to, like, spy on someone who's, like, changing their clothes or in the shower or whatever. But instead, it's just his, his pastry, his donut. How uncharacteristic. Every time we come up here, we see. Every time we come up here, we see the sheriff. I have uh, flashbacks to our money game where he was caused me so much pain. The uh, sheriff in that game, who I pictured the sheriff of this game, and I was correct. Yeah, there were there were some similarities for sure. He was fairly closely based off that guy. I'm counting on an encore exposition of the talent you showed earlier. Well, she wasn't a vampire, but... And remember, Maybe they... Under no Gollum. Right. Yeah. I guess he didn't cause me pain, he caused my Good. character pain, but, you know, there'll never be repercussions for that for anybody. I mean, of course not. When have my actions ever had negative consequences, or consequences of any kind? <laughs> Actions do not have consequences. We 
watch. Yeah, I kind of fell asleep in the middle of the season finale to season three of the Magnus Archives, but I assumed the unknowing was successful, and that we now live <laughs> in an a-causal world where. Uh... You are you are incorrect. Uh, my poor wi my beautiful wife Nikola Orsinov uh, was blown up by an agent of the hunt. By the way, uh, I have gotten to the end of Magnus Season 4. Apparently, according to the Requiem, Magnus Season 5 is not so good. I will at least try to give it a listen. Um, not promising I'll get all the way through it, but I'm also probably not going to listen to it until the season is all the way out, which is probably going to be long after this recording. So when discussing the Magnus Archives on uh, as part of the Vampire Bloodlines playthrough, pretty safe to say it's going to be mainly focused on the first four seasons. Um, yep. Which I guess since you uh, brought up season four, we might as well talk about it. But yeah, uh, so long as we're the Ankaran Sarcophagus, there's not a whole lot to talk about with regards to what's going on with the game there, although I am going to try and be a little bit of a sneak here. Um, Other than the sexiness of mummies, but that goes without saying. <laughs> yes, of course. The mummies. The mummy scene in this game is the part you're looking forward to. Yeah, yeah. And what else is there in the game? Like, like oh, when there's... you were like, you told me like, Requiem, uh, do you want to play, we'll do Vampire uh, the Masquerade Bloodlines, and you're like, but here's my pitch for you, is there is going to be a mummy? I was like, you had me at mummy. And then, then I was like, that was the last word that I said, so... <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm glad that it worked, but it's weird that you phrased it that way. <laughs> so, yeah, you had me at literally the very last word of your pitch. Well, okay, so the whole thing was necessary then. I'm glad that, I guess I, I efficiently blocked that pitch out then. Magnus season four, I don't, it's been a while. Like, I know there's mummies in Magnus, but I don't remember if it has a Magnus in it has a mummy in that season. Yeah, well, my main takeaway from Magnus Season 4, and uh, major spoilers, by the way, I'll throw a timestamp on it, may or may not be the beginning of the next episode like it was last time. Uh, but my main takeaway from Magnus Season 4 is that Daisy did nothing wrong, <laughs> and the hunt is the good guys. Like, they keep saying, oh, do you want to tell, you know, do you want me to tell you about the things that Daisy did, and they're always like, no. And it's just kind of like, oh, do you want me to show you Daisy's terrible character traits? And it's like, no, I think the telling was good enough. Let's go ahead and just move <laughs> on. Like, you know, what are Daisy's terrible crimes? Well, her first, you know, the thing that set her on this dark path is that uh, she killed a serial killer who was killing people with his superpowers from the slaughter, so he was basically immune to mortal prosecution because his uh, modus operandi was not something that any court could possibly, you know, recognize. And uh, what other crimes does she commit? Uh, well, she kills Michael Crew, who is also a supernatural serial killer whose method of murder could not possibly be prosecuted in court. Uh, she helped prevent the unknowing. And she talks about how, like, oh, well, you insisted that we make sure there's no damage to collateral, uh, you know, there's, there's no collateral damage to surrounding buildings, so I'm going to place the explosives more carefully than I would like to if I were operating on my own. But seeing as how she never, ever harms another innocent person, it kind of comes across like posturing to me. Like, she wants I to honestly, seem really like... dangerous, but she never actually kills anyone who isn't a monster. Now, the one thing... That was kind of that she almost did something, actually did something in the podcast, not just vague gestures that she did something terrible at some point, but we aren't going to show you what it is. Uh, you she almost killed Jonathan Sims on two different occasions. Uh, and so, like, okay, that was that, you know, had she done that, that would have legitimately been murdering someone for basically no reason, you know, just because they had been touched by an avatar, which. You know, Jonathan Sims wasn't hurting anyone, so that you know, or, you know, he wasn't at that time hurting anyone. So, in fairness, you know, 
Daisy killing Jonathan Sims would, to her own knowledge, have been unjustified. But it turns out it would have been a really good idea. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking that, like, the hunt is just the good guys. <laughs> that it's, like, a cannibal entity that primarily derives fear from, like, avatars and monsters of other entities. This is my new they... headcanon. <laughs> they really messed up with the hunt getting too focused. Making every... Making it so monsters could only be killed by people who had supernatural powers was a mistake. Because... <sighs> Like, it was completely unnecessary in the first place, but also then you get to the thing where Cam just talked about with, like, it kind of makes the hunters look like good guys. And also, as we've talked about before, how, like, I think there's interesting stories you could do with a monster hunter who was ruthless and, like, who would kill anybody who's... Regardless of whether they're not touched by an entity, regardless of whether they're a full avatar. Like, if you want to make Daisy's uh, hunt sinister, you want her to kill somebody like uh, Georgie or Oliver or uh, that girl Carolina who was on the uh, who was in the subway and it nearly crushed her and then now she just follows her wherever she goes. Somebody who has been super a altered by the supernatural but is not really serving and harmful to other people. Like that would make her her hunt seem more obsessive and more dangerous, but she just kills, as far as we can tell, avatars. He's got to start working with yeah. And again, so they're all actively serving, either school. they're actively serving it or they're at the point where, like, that's the only way you can deal with them. Like, Jane Prentice was a victim, but she was also, there's not a solution to her. That if you, you can't do anything to her other than destroy her, because she is so dangerous at that point. Right. Flex, yeah, and they just handing out those diplomas nowadays. It is like Jonathan Sims was the one place where you could make the argument where, okay, she never pulled the trigger, but she got pretty close. And, you know, he was a perfectly innocent person. Um, you know, to the extent that he'd done anything wrong, he'd be more chalked up to incompetence, um, particularly <laughs> under, you know, being bad at dealing with high-pressure situations, making bad decisions under pressure, rather than any kind of actual malice. Uh, All right. I got you a copy of but that, then it turns out that he was literally the key to ending the world. So, yeah, it is, you know, Daisy didn't know that, but again, it kind of it feels like the hunt is directing her towards people who really seriously do need to die. All the hunt episodes end up being <laughs> focused on being a hunter rather than being hunted. It's, right. There's one episode <laughs> where it's really about being hunted. And that's super early, and was kind of a weak episode anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember if I talked about this on camera. I can never remember whether I talked about these things on camera or not. But, where it is, like, that, that's the episode that sticks out. The reason why I remember that one, out of the 160 Magnus episodes I've listened to, I remember that one as the one where the protagonist, like, in the middle of the climax, is like, oh, by the way, did I mention I'm a retired spec ops? <laughs> so, yeah, I just shot the monster dead. <laughs> To stay out of sight. Which it apparently is. he could do, which is one of those things where I thought only an avatar could kill an avatar. I mean, there was a monster, not an avatar, so I guess maybe that doesn't count. But, yeah. There's also, this comes up, this is finally spelled out in Season 4, uh, talking about the dark for a second, because uh, it's something interesting that I think they could have explored a little more, but they kind of, and this has been a problem with not really detailing the avatar's motivation. So, both of the avatars of the dark that we have interacted with, we have Manuela, who was some sort of this, and we have Maxwell Rayner, who used to be Edmund Halley, an astronomer, which I kind of like, my headcanon is that the dark, people who fall to the dark want to re-enchant the world. That's why it keeps being scientists, because they've they explained away so much of the world that they want back the innocence they had before they had this amount of knowledge. Sort of a Adorno-esque critique of science. Uh, and there's something that's going to come up in season five that is really interesting that they could have done something a little more interesting with. Uh, I but almost wonder if I should... Uh catch up on season five just so i can this isn't like a magnus arcast podcast but it is the 
the horror property we're both listening to right now, so it's like, <laughs> it keeps being relevant. It's like, it's not, I, I think that you could say, like, we don't see a ton of avatars, so it's not like we have other avatars to compare it as, but I do think it is interesting that the two avatars we know of who are associated with the dark are both scientists. Or former scientists, I guess. And also, we finally, uh, you finally met an avatar of the buried. Yeah. There's the, the gravedigger fella. Yep. I like that episode. That was a good episode. Like, I like when it gives us insight into avatars and into monsters. Like... I guess I have a certain empathy for monsters and the monstrous. Uh... Should I be concerned about that? Probably not. I mean, I guess... Uh I've yeah, already that... fallen to the lonely, it's fine. The lonely doesn't produce monsters. The lonely's like the hunt, it's a good entity. Peter Lucas was trying to prevent the extinction, remember? That didn't sound right, but I don't know enough about the lonely to question it, to dispute it. <laughs> Were there any episodes you particularly liked? Um, I did really like the one with the Gravekeeper. Uh, the one where Jonathan has to go into the Lonely to rescue Martin, I really liked. Do you ship it? Oh, yes. <laughs> I do demand that uh, it have a good ship name. Which, not John Martin. Yeah, no, like, and not like Jartin or Jontin or something else dumb like that. The Ruby fandom has this figured out. I don't know if they were the first ones, but uh, apparently the uh, Peter Lucas Elias ship is called Lonely Eyes, which like more like that. <laughs> and I have decided that the uh, ship name for. Uh, Jonathan and Martin should be I need him to be okay. <laughs> okay. Dude, you are mind controlled. What the hell? Well, Troy isn't gonna like this, but fuck him. I assume we were not gonna side with him anyways. Yeah, I mean I was never really planning on siding with him. I mainly, I did just want to, you know, make it a thing where, like, I was turning my back on him, not like... <laughs> I'm incompetent. <laughs> so I had to go to somebody else. Right. Any episodes you did not like? Thing. Uh, the episode where he got Daisy out of the buried. Uh, the horror for that one on me didn't really work. It gets back into the Daisy did nothing wrong thing, where, you know, there is a huge focus on how bad Daisy felt about all those terrible things she did off screen. <laughs> so, yeah, so much of the episode was built on, you know, please just trust us that she did bad things. Like, I find it perfectly believable that she did bad things. But I believe that it happened is not enough for the narrative. I need to actually see it. You know, it's plausible. It's not the same as it was properly set up. I think I managed to run myself out of blood. See if I've got enough fumes left to harvest blood with magic. I oh, know, hang on, I can. Ah, oh, 
I do have left of Harvest Blood with magic. enough to increase my firearm skill so I can hopefully attack with some basic modicum of accuracy. <laughs> We're gonna get chewed out by the toy, aren't we? Probably a little bit, but I mean... You know, like, had we done this the way we wanted to, he might have, like, given us a sample of, like, a new type of Lacroix water. Like, I could have... We could have tested it for him. We're in LA, that's all anybody drinks. <laughs> no wonder it's full of vampires. So which Magnus entity is responsible for a city where people only ever drink the memory of a flavor? <laughs> oh man. Would that be the Watcher? I'm not sure, I mean, that feels like more of a... It doesn't feel like a fear, it feels like more of a, a bitter sweetness. So... Yeah, I was able to sneak through this when I was, you know playing on my own, but uh, distracted by conversation. You know, it was touch and go even then, so I guess I never really stood a chance fault. when I distracted. I mean, I wasn't going to say it out loud, but... <laughs> I mean, we are in the middle of a quote-unquote crowded restaurant. Pizza Surf would never do anything to harm us. When did the mannequins get knives? <laughs> like, those are sharp looking knives. I mean, some people eat pizza with a fork and knife. Like, it's weird, but you know. Again, Cam, I don't think mannequins, this, is, this whole setup is not normal. I I'm telling you, it's just how they're doing things after the pandemic. It's just like the hotel. Remember the motel? So are we going to be attacked by spiders? Is that what you're saying? Oh shit, I forgot how that ended. <laughs> Okay, this is not at all like the motel. This is totally fine. Anyways, if you were going to be attacked by spiders, there clearly wouldn't be so many mannequins. Right, right. Oh, hey, it's your coffee. <gasps> Sexy mummy! This is probably fine. Open it. I know, I've kind of consistently been told not to open it. Open it. I don't have the key. There's a little piece missing, see? That's bullshit. Okay. We have a new goal. We need to get a key to the sarcophagus so that we can open it. So then we can advance the mummy. We can marry the mummy. We can devote our lives to the mummy. Okay, I don't want to hear a single goddamn thing from you about Fang Requiem. <laughs> Unless it's that you're agreeing that we should call him to help no. us get at well. I no, we're fine. We're fine. It's just mannequins. I fought mannequins before. I mean, I was gonna say I do think we're okay right now because it's just mannequins, and mannequins aren't dangerous. Oh, hey there, buddy. That's right. This room is only temporarily empty because our buddy helped clear it out for us. That guy's gonna die, by the way. Because like you said, if this goes screwy, he doesn't know us. I am just... I'm perfectly willing to use you as a human shield if they attack. Ah, oh, shit. They got on either side of us. I was not prepared for that. Well, I guess we could try to stealth. 
I could be very quiet. <laughs> or I can talk it incessantly, whatever. What the hell? Okay. I mean, I guess that was a waste of ammo, but whatever. That wall was attacking us. <laughs> you all saw it. So yeah, we got it on tape. And if the video of that tape should mysteriously go missing, then let the record show that the wall was attacking us. Why are you not selling me machine pistol ammo, Mercurio? I thought you were an arms dealer. Now, speaking of you being an arms dealer... Anything I can do? Oh, no, I don't need to buy equipment right now. I need to set you up to get me... Good equipment later on. Not easy, even in this country. Military grade sniper rifle with 50 caliber ammo could take a man apart at quite a distance. This is even better strategy. I can, however, get my hands on a SWAT rifle of a decent value. Specifically, what you want is some bad 15. I got a connection for those, but I haven't seen them in a while. Give me some There's a bunch of good voice actors in this game. Mercurio is another one. Yeah. Dang it, I don't know, I don't know what you're selling right now. I want to open up your inventory later. Ah, I keep anything I can do for you tonight. Keep saying I need equipment because I need info on equipment. <laughs> Like a very effective means of locomotion. I'm assuming you're just like in a wagon and you just fired the gun backwards and the recoil pushed you along. But uh specifically, only a lunatic would want that kind of ordinance. That's why they got him in Washington. I like that line. Yeah, so uh I don't know if it's required to ask him about that to get him to sell you that stuff later on. I do know you have to save him from LaCroix, but, uh... LaCroix's gonna hurt him? Why would LaCroix ever betray anyone? He seems very trustworthy. Yeah, do you kind of feel like he should be placed in charge of a city? No. Does he look like a hag? Yo. Not a special interview. Down the street. Don't forget to sneak. Now get a move. Are we gonna try to sneak this time? I mean, we tried to sneak last time. But are we also going to try to sneak this time? Yes. Alright. Uh, Shooting Andy. your way through this is actually I'm fairly Andy. difficult. Come in, Andy. Mm. Come check this out. I just saw a Berlin plate. Also, I found the stealth book on this playthrough, so, you know, we do have a tiny amount of stealth from that, you know, one dot in stealth, decent dexterity. I like how we just kind of like wriggle around while we're crouching down. That makes us hard to spot. The eye is drawn to stillness, so be sure to writhe slightly while hiding. <laughs> if you walk without rhythm, you won't attract the worm. I've been thinking about this for a while, and I've not been able to arrive at an answer for it. Like, uh, I don't know if we've mentioned it on the podcast, but Nina Auerbach, uh, our vampires ourselves, where she talks about how every AIDS gets the vampire it deserves. Sort of the new historicist analysis of the vampire. What is this? Like, what is the historical context that gave what rise to vampire the masquerade specific type of vampire like i've been trying to like work it out in my head like comes out in 91 i think so you would there, you would think there'd be some sort of cold war context uh, that 
drives it in part, like a lot of 80s culture. Like, 91 being essentially part of the 80s. The same way, right. like, the year 2000 is part of the 90s. Because, yeah, the, the switch from one decade to another takes time to happen. So in the first year or two, it more resembles the decade previous to it than the decade it's actually a part of. Yeah, I would say, especially, like, for those three decades, I would say the 80s ends with the fall of the Soviet Union, and the 90s ends on 9-11. But coming out in 91, so you think, like, instinctively, I want to say that it's, uh, I, I better make sure that it is actually 91. <laughs> the original release is 91 for sure. But that said, the original Vampire, uh, the tone goes through, like, it's not unrecognizable or anything, but the tone definitely does shift in a noticeable way between the original release and where it ends up. Oh my god, you can just do the deck cams to, uh, Okay, we don't even need to get out to the sarcophagus. That makes this considerably easier. Well, I, mean, I think about, like, another piece of, like, high else. 90s culture being, like, or two pieces of high 90s culture would be, like, Fight Club or uh, The Matrix, both of which are, like, heavily defined by a sense of sort of, like, the world being out of joint, uh, not having any purpose. I feel like Vampire, you have the context of, like, the approaching end of the world feels much more 80s than 90s. Like... And the Camarillo Sabat division feels kind of, like, in between. I can see you making a case for Black, the 80s, like, clearly defined sides thing. Like, it's more ambiguous than a lot of 80s stuff. But on the other hand, you get into sort of like the X Men or something. Not not like the X Men obviously come out in like the sixties, but like I feel like this sort of the nineties is when you really start seeing this on the the way the X Men are done is with the sort of like more ambiguity between the sides because like the evil mutants they're the bad guys, but they still like they're kind of a little bit justified. Right. Uh, like in the first X Men movie. That, I would uh, assume, is a reaction to Watchmen. So close. Okay. Let me get my gun out. But Watchmen, uh, you know, had Ozymandias as the villain with a point. So. Watchmen is 80s, right? Well, yeah, like, which is what I'm saying here, is that I would pin Watchmen as the turning point for that in comic books, particularly. Well, in Watchmen, you get the thing where I would say that Watchmen is, it's definitely the response to what had been the more d defined good and evil, and it also, you could make an argument for being kind of a response to, or criticism of this Cold War idea of, you know, we've got the Americans who are the good guys and the Soviet Union are the bad guys. Uh, I think Alan Moore is some sort of socialist. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, even the pictures of him on the internet with, like, a communist flag t-shirt and shit, so. Uh, and then, like, that idea gets picked up and sort of not always done the way Watchmen did it. Like, a lot of times just, oh, it's dark and broody and we're kind of missing the point. But, but I don't, I'm not sure about where you would point to that with Vampire. Like, We've talked about what they said their inspirations were, so the pro and like what could come out, like Lost Boys. I really don't believe that they didn't read Anne Rice until then. I just I don't believe that. Yeah, no, that I mean it's, it's pretty. Just, it's so obvious the antecedent for this. Yeah, and that's like. I don't think there's a necessity to say that like. Uh, like I don't think vampires were the vampire of the decade they were from. Right, like Vampire the Masquerade. I think the Vampire of the '80s. I, you know, I don't think that was Masquerade. I'm actually not sure who the '80s was because Interview with the Vampire was actually the '70s, wasn't it? So. Yeah, but I think uh, the two sequels are '80s. So okay, you could say that that vision of the vampire hit its stride in the '80s, and that would be fair. Because Lestat, like, is 
Like, Louis does not like being a vampire. Lestat seems to just love it. And there's one of the things I like best about those books, by the way, is that there are these two very different perspectives on it. Like... You have the vampire rock star, and then you have the, the brooding, remorseful vampire. Uh, the vampire of the 90s, I feel, is pretty clearly Angel, even though most of his own spin-off show was in the 2000s. Uh, it was early 2000s, and he is ultimately from a show that started in 1997. That's a very multifaceted vampire. Although I almost I would almost argue it's a little bit of a backslide because I, as I recall in Buffy the the vampire is essentially a separate personality. Only because of you, what you did to me. Right. Here, I, uh, it, I got you. In the first couple of seasons, it's not really like that. The vampire isn't a separate personality; it's just the person they are, but devoid of any kind of uh, conscience or empathy. And so, you know, part part of the idea is that, uh, which is really good is that Angel's had this sort of hedonistic streak that got extremely cruel when he became a vampire, whereas previously, you know, he, was, he just liked to have a party, and, you know, he was maybe a little bit irresponsible, but was basically a decent person. It's like and, your unfettered id. Right. Which was a compelling idea, but it got boulderized over the course of the series into the vampire being effectively a totally distinct personality, uh, which it demolished Angel's character in particular because it meant that he could not reasonably be held responsible for uh, what Angelus did because Angelus is so clearly a completely different person. Yeah. I prefer, like, if, I prefer, like, it to be not a separate, like, there, obviously there have been vampires, but the vampire is essentially a separate being in this body, like, uh, that, see, it borderline seems like that in Dracula. Like, it's hard to tell. Like, it, there's po points when Le Lucy is being vampirized where it seems like vampire Lucy is a totally separate thing from human Lucy. And I'm also, also thinking of Order of the Stick, where a vampire is specifically an evil spirit driving around a dead body. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, very explicitly, which... I, I really prefer it's like being a vampire is you're still you, but maybe you've been changed in a way that makes you darker, more prone to. Yeah, I really like that too. I especially like. I like the idea that when someone is first brought back as a vampire, they are indistinguishable from who they were before, right? Like there is no yeah. immediate change, but having new predatory instincts will shape their personality over time, and you know they don't necessarily have to turn into a monster, right? Uh, but it's going to change them. But it is, yeah, it is going to change them. And if they don't turn into a monster, it's going to be because they found some way to manage their new instincts. Uh, That's a more interesting, I think, multifaceted way of doing it than just having them essentially, yeah. essentially a, a new person in this body. So, yeah, the first two or three seasons of Buffy. That's basically, yeah, that, yeah, that's the angle they took. Uh, especially season two, when Angel versus Angelus was a whole thing. But yeah, the longer it went on. The, the more they lost the plot on that, and it is too bad, because Angelus was a much more compelling villain when he was just uh, angel with all compassion and responsibility bled out of him. Now, I'm pausing on this dialogue real quick. Uh, Heather is being very patient with us. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> so this is Heather Poe. This is our ghoul. And, uh... The way that's set up... Um, there's basically, there's three approaches you can take with, uh, with Heather here, which is you can treat her like basically a pet, you can treat her like a tool, or you can tell her to get out of your life completely because it's, you know, it's, it's too dangerous to her, for her. Noticeably absent, there is no way to treat her as like a functioning adult. <laughs> who can make her own decisions. Yeah. Now, in fairness, she is a ghoul. Uh, she can't actually, you know, the, the relevant decision here being whether or not she wants to stay with you. She is extremely insistent that yes, of course she does, but she's not thinking straight. And, uh, like, the amount of time it takes for ghoul blood to wear off is measured in months. So... 
in terms of game mechanics, you know, telling her to come back after the stuff is worn off if she really wants to be part of this is basically the same as telling her to, you know, just fuck off completely. With that said, <laughs> number one, they don't establish that, uh, which, and I, I would have accepted that of basically just establishing that uh, because of the supernatural conditions involved, having her make a decision, an informed decision as an adult, is just not possible. She's, you know, you had to feed her vampire blood to get her out of that hospital alive, and that has altered her cognition in a way that will not revert to normal within the time frame of the game. There's more complex stuff that I'm going to get into now, but, uh... If they had just, you know, given out an explanation for this is why you cannot engage with Heather as a rational adult within the time frame of this game, that would have, like, satisfied me. Um, which we're going to go with the Heather is our pet route for this because I don't want to skip the content of Heather completely, but I also don't want to be a callous asshole to her for no reason, so... Uh, the thing is, like, talking to Heather... Right? Like, if you do keep her as your ghoul and you, uh. Evening, Missy. You back to see Mr. Detroit again? Yeah. So, uh, you got the suit you came in. What? so and, you, and you learn more of her backstory. Nice guy. What you learn her from her is that she has very few connections uh, in the world. Uh. She is in college and studying for a degree in, like, fashion design, I think it is. Some kind of creative thing. And she seems like someone who could really benefit from a vampire patron. Like, this doesn't have to be a one-sided relationship where she is at best a pet. This could be, and this is something that, like... If I were playing this, like, as an actual tabletop RPG, then I would expect the GM to... Uh, roll with this approach, but I would not expect a computer RPG to have it programmed in um, because it is, it's is—it's a very involved thing to do and it's a slice of content that very few players will care about. But like you are absolutely capable of entering into, like again you know, in narrative terms, in the game you can't but you should logically be absolutely capable of entering into I a mutually oh, beneficial I'm... relationship with Heather. Like, drawing her into this life is not going to destroy her because she doesn't have much of a life to leave behind. Unless, of course, you literally get her killed, but, uh... Why would that ever happen? Well, I mean, that can happen, or you can prioritize her safety, in One which case she'll be fine. Is monitoring the police right now. Very sloppy. I stated explicitly that you are not to kill any police officers. Their deaths were quite unfortunate, and we have to generate spin to attach the blame to natural causes. I mean, natural causes? Not terrorists? And the Ankaran sarcophagus. What did you see? Both of them. Let's not jump to conclusions. Give me the manifest in your notes. I'll sort this mess later. You might have noticed the new full moon. The parade of malingering Molly couples filing... He also seems like he's almost doing a transatlantic thing. Which is potentially intentional. Because if we talk about his backstory, he claims to be French. So, some people theorize that LaCroix is actually an American vampire who is putting on airs of being much older than he actually is. That he's only like two or three hundred years old. Relatively young in vampire terms. But he's putting on airs of being, you know, a middle-aged, a medieval-era vampire from, from Europe. And exactly where from Europe is apparently flexible. Those were the primogen of the city's clan elders. Worrisome bunch devoted first and foremost to the security of their own skin. Which is why they're here. It seems Alistair Grout... Malkavian primogen 
As you'd have forgotten how to answer this phone, you would miss it. The Sabat's appearance has put the Primogen on edge. Grout's mansion is in the Hollywood Hills. I need you to pry Grout out of whatever trap he's crawled into and have him contact us. Each minor problem is like a grain of sand. Each night, I inherit the desert. It's the seemingly insignificant, time-consuming trivialities that plague my mind. Which is why, when I assign you a simple task, I only want to hear unbridled vehemence on your part. Understood? The vehemence no. will be directed at you. <laughs> I'm assigning you something that can't be screwed up. Charitably. So send Mercurio. This is a chance to gain a small but significant amount of my good graces back. I strongly urge you. Why are you fighting him, little mess? Go see Grout. Yes. Uh, about Grout. As I said, Grout is the mountain. You just want to demonstrate that that would happen? Yeah. Yeah. Is that. He will dominate you into it if you try to He's tell him no. So. Fun fact. So you may have to check under every bed in the place for him. When we hear from Grout, you may come back. Fun fact. Hang Requiem cannot actually do that, Kip. Are you sure? I mean, I find it very difficult to refuse him basically anything. That has to be yeah, supernatural. That's why we had to get you a marrow transplant. <laughs> I, I mean, I felt like that was unnecessary. I had plenty of marrow left. Also, I didn't actually lose the marrow to him. I lost the marrow to the witch who lives inside Monster Prom. He just took blood. Via PayPal. I'm dead. That line's probably going in a trailer. There are mannequins in here multiplying. They've all kind of surrounded us. Yeah, I mean, some staff must have just come in while we weren't looking and uh, just rearranged them in such a way that, uh, you know, made us feel like the center of attention. It's... I'm telling you, it's all, it's all just about atmosphere. Yeah, I'll just hold on, hold on. I'm going to open up the back of your laptop. I stored something in here. Hold on. It's like a centimeter thick. What could you possibly have in there? Oh, yeah. There we go. My gun. Don't ask me how, how? I got it in there. Well, but, oh, 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 okay then. Just, just in case. See, the mannequins are backing off now, somehow. 